Both of our passages today deal with how we're to engage with each other in community. It seems like the ways in which we nurture and tend to our relationships reveals much to the world about the God we worship. Paul tells us that we are to put on Christ so that his love can shape the way we treat each other, even when we're in conflict. Now imagine you're an outsider visiting our country today and studying its culture. What would you notice about the way we handle conflict? I think you might be struck with just how pervasive conflict is in our everyday interactions, how we're really quite accomplished at nurturing conflict. Social media seems to be the place where we pick our side and revel in the accolades for being so brilliant and then respond with disgust and revulsion when confronted with anything that contradicts or opposes us. Because my side is all good and your side is all bad. We diligently hone the distinctions between us and them. The result seems to be a distancing from all that doesn't fit our ideology. As our circle narrows and becomes more like-minded, our likes and accolades grow and it seems that everyone sees things the way I do. When we cancel out all voices but our own, it becomes easier to demonize other points of view and dehumanize those who think differently. If we have any nagging doubts about some aspect of our side, or if we have some experience that contradicts what's supposed to be the accepted narrative, we fear rejection for even bringing it up. As an outsider studying our culture, you might notice that there are real issues of violence and racism, bullying and oppression, health, economic and environmental insecurity. These are complex issues with many facets, but the collective consensus seems to be that if each one of us picks our side and proclaims it loudly and often, then we've done our part to solve the problem. An outsider might notice that our efforts are more effective at creating solid and rigid ideologies than they are at addressing these issues. Conflict is a normal part of our experience as humans. We all have different experiences and skills and expertise that shape our perspectives in different ways, ways that just may contradict each other. Jesus seemed to be addressing this common issue in the passage from Matthew that we read about handling conflict or broken relationships within the body of Christ. Where our culture seems to push us away from those with other viewpoints, Jesus has us moving toward each other. Where our culture expects us to pick a side and stick with it unwaveringly, Jesus calls us to listen to each other. Now, first glance, the way Jesus describes the scenario, it seems that there is a clear sinner and a clear accuser or confronter. But if that's so, why then would we need to listen to each other? Well, we know in our own experience that our actions and reactions are complicated and inter interconnected. Uh, as parents raising two boys, we often found ourselves trying to help resolve conflicts that were presented as well, it all started when he hit me back. It's not always easy to assign clear blame and fault. Truly listening to each other isn't easy because it may lead us to a place we didn't expect. Truly listening means that my perspective may be challenged. I may have some things wrong. I may have misunderstood something about the other person and they may have misunderstood something about me. But as we draw closer and listen to each other, we may find that we can move forward together in a new understanding. It's interesting to note that this teaching in Matthew comes shortly after Jesus' parable of the lost sheep. You know the one where a sheep wanders off and the shepherd leaves the 99 to go and bring it back? Well, just for a minute, play along with me here and pretend that this flock is the church. And imagine, if you will, how the flock might handle the situation when the wandering sheep is brought back. Would you expect the 99 to confront him about his sinful wandering behavior or his lack of commitment to the flock? Or would the wandering sheep confront the flock for excluding him and blocking his access to food, leading him to go off on his own to find nourishment just so he wouldn't starve? What if the flock didn't intend to block him from food, but in pursuing their own interest, they did so inadvertently? 
Now that they know that the wandering sheep wasn't rejecting them, but was merely hungry, will they change their behavior so he can eat? Now, granted, this is a bit of a silly example, but it illustrates what can happen in communities. We are designed to live together in community. We're designed to be interdependent. And so like it or not, our actions and attitudes have both intended and unintended effects on others. Each of us created in God's image brings different experiences and perspectives and personalities and gifts into the community, which may at times lead to conflict. But our diversity was designed to interact in ways that build each other up. Jesus' teaching encourages us to acknowledge our interdependence and to confront conflict and issues, not so we can get to the bottom of who's to blame, but so that we can move toward each other, so we can move toward reconciliation. We're very familiar with the pick your side and shame anyone who disagrees process, which results in anger and division. We're also pretty familiar with the just be nice and don't say anything directly approach to relationship damage control. But this tends to nurse resentment, especially when we discuss it with everyone except the offending party, and means that there will always be that elephant in the room clouding our interactions. Actually, in most church conflicts, both sides feel they have been sinned against. The conflicts and issues we face are complex and the sides we take have seeds of both solution and harm which we'll never discover if we stay entrenched in opposing camps. Instead, Jesus calls us to seek reconciliation so that we can move forward in new ways. Going directly to someone with whom we're in conflict involves some honest self-reflection. Why is it that I'm so troubled by this issue? Am I willing to think through why this situation makes me anxious or fearful? Am I willing to listen and take in new information that may change how I view the situation? In the face of conflict and broken relationships, Jesus invites us into a spiritual process of discernment and listening to each other. It's a process of bringing us, them, and God together into a safe place, into holy ground in order to seek new understanding. It requires humility and vulnerability to allow space for the Spirit to work within us and between us. It involves courage and openness as we may discover where we got it wrong. It's a process where our love for those with whom we disagree drives our curiosity to ask questions about their point of view. And it requires imagination and discernment to put the pieces together in new ways. In times of conflict, we are to move toward each other in Jesus' name so that we can receive the gift of new life in our relationships. And even if we don't reach agreement, we're to treat those on the other side like a Gentile or tax collector. And remember that Jesus didn't spur or cancel out the Gentiles and tax collectors. He ate with them, listened to them. He loved them. What a contrast this is to the ways of the world where those on the other side are to be rejected and shamed. When we engage in the spiritual work of reconciliation, we bear witness to the God of reconciliation, God who sent his son into the world so that we would be reconciled to him. When we engage in the spiritual work of reconciliation, we put on Christ so that his love can shape the way we treat each other, even when we're in conflict. And in this way, we bear witness to God's unfailing love that seeks to do no harm, his merciful love that tends to the well-being of others. This is what distinguishes us as followers of Christ. They will know we are Christians by our love. Praise, glory, and honor to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.